Welcome back to Coffee and Cream, a podcast where we're changing the narrative one cup of coffee at a time. My name is Jake, and I'm here with Matt Bryant. What is going on, my brother? Dude, it's been a busy season right now. Yes, it has. There's a lot going on. Puzzle um, pieces everywhere, man. Puzzle pieces, yeah. We're just, uh, yeah, we're trying to pick, put together the cosmic puzzle mm-hmm, of life. Mm-hmm. And then uh, so far, we're not doing very well. <laughs> that, and, <laughs> that is the truth. That I'm missing true. pieces. I can't find them. <laughs> Wait a minute, is there. this the same puzzle that we've been working on? Right, yeah, these pieces are different, like different What's colors. What's going on? Um, but yeah, dude, no, doing really well. Um, yeah. Little girl is, uh, we think she's sleep regressing, uh, so that means that she is waking up earlier and earlier, Yeah. and yeah. that means I got up at 3 a.m. this morning just to give her a, a bottle. And for our listeners and watchers, we're recording this at 7 a.m. We got here at 6.30. 6.30 in the morning. Yeah. So my man Jake... Is a strong brother. Was what? St- You're sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm feeling really good though. I normally get up at like five in the morning, so this is like you know one interruption. What? What's one interruption yeah. gonna do to me? I mean, it's <laughs> Saturday. I'm gonna go probably back home and take a nap, uh, watch some Hulu. We started watching a, a show called The Gift. Oh, really? I saw that pop up on my Hulu. Is it good? <laughs> <laughs> I like so I baseline knew about some of the stuff. Like so apparently like it's in, based on real events. Okay. A woman tricked her daughter into believing she was diseased with all of these chronic illnesses, huh. like for years. Yeah, and you know what comes with that? Lots of money and people giving you things. And so she built up this mass fortune of like scamming wow. people, and her daughter believed that she was sick with all these things. <laughs> Come to find out, mom gets murdered. And the show is about what led up to that. Because oh. the daughter is in jail. Because I guess she hired a hitman. Oh. Once she found out what the mom was doing. Oh, that is, is really... <laughs> dude, the show... We're only, we're only two episodes in. So I, I, can't, I can't put my full endorsement on the show yet. <laughs> but the first two episodes are really, really well done. All right, I might be so, my next... Uh... My, my my next watch. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's really good. How are you doing, man? Bro, I'm I'm tired. Yeah, but I'm good. And I'm not maybe wake up at three a.m. tired, sure. but I'm tired but good. L- busy season, man. Yeah, I'm moving a lot. Uh, preaching more in yeah. different churches, which has been great. That's awesome, dude. Yeah, I'm preaching at my dad's church uh, a couple Sundays. Yeah, yeah. 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 Pastor Ooh. Brad, bring it in. Papa Brad, shout out. Come back. You come back. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, we'll see what happens. We'll episode, see what happens. Episode, episode fourteen. Yeah. <laughs> No, it was um yeah, it's been busy. Uh we found a place for Amanda and I. And so she's moving in in a couple weeks there. So That's it's, awesome, dude. It's a nice place, man. I'm excited about it. You're you know? in Southampton, right? Yep, Southampton. Uh for those that l- live in St. Louis, you know where that is. Yeah, you know. I'm I'm walking distance away from Russell's, which is a bomb Ooh, restaurant. Man. And Lola Jeans. And coffee. Lola Jeans. And oh, it's at Clementine's that just built up over there. Yes. Five minute walk. Which you know is not good for the pocketbook, strict budget life. But you know, five minute drive to Target and Chick Fil A. Yep, yep, mm. You're right there. So uh, it's a real nice place. I'm uh, Club Fitness too. Yeah, there I'm you go. Definitely have to go to Club the Fitness. Tri- to you got all the things around. <laughs> so I'm gonna go eat some Clementines and I'm gonna run it. Uh, no, I'm not gonna <laughs> run. I don't. I don't run. Who runs? <laughs> but no, we're excited, man. It's a good season of life. Uh, premarital counseling's rolling well. Awesome, dude. Um, just busy. Work's picking up. Yeah. More responsibilities. Great. Uh, in a season of life where God is teaching me that I'm not. It's okay not to be the best at mm. things, which you know for me is like nails on a chalkboard at the beginning, but eventually right. it's freeing. Right. So, but yeah, man, it's been a great season of life. Yeah, man, that's yeah. That, that's really awesome. Yeah. I'm, now, you know what makes anything better, like any season of life better? Mm. Coffee. Coffee. Absolutely. Yes. I I told someone on Twitter, my greatest fear is sharks and running out of coffee, but mostly sharks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I am afraid of running out of coffee at any point, mm. which is why I always try to go to switch coffee. Oh, that transition. <laughs> sliding the DMs like that. Um, sliding the transition. I don't know. I'm just making crap up at this point. Uh, guys, uh, switch coffee. These guys roast Incredible beans. They are doing some amazing work here in St. Louis, empowering communities. They are changing mm. the conversation around 
uh, just any type of topic, racial reconciliation, mm. um, uh, justice issues. I mean, they are doing an incredible job yeah. at, at doing what they're doing. Uh, so if you want to support them, you can go to Switch Coffee at switchcoffee.co. You can follow them on Twitter uh, and Instagram at Switch Coffee Co. Mm-hmm. And follow them on Facebook. Guys, give them, give them some love because these guys are worthy of all of it. These guys are great. Yeah, boy. I uh, also want to give a huge shout out to our other sponsor for the day, John Morgan. John! John. John, John. If you guys want video marketing that gets you the results you're looking for, mm-hmm. then you guys seriously need to go to JM Films Boom. at jmfilms.com. Mm. They're killing it, man. They're killing it, dude. They're killing it. He could even be here today because he's probably at work. Yeah, probably. He's killing it. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, you know, we, yeah. Mm-mm. Get on him. Get on him. <laughs> Just get on him. So we have a very special guest with us today. Mm-hmm. We have none other than the author, mm-hmm. prolific author, mm-hmm. <laughs> Amy Bird. How are you doing, Amy? I'm doing great. It's an honor to be here with you guys. Yeah. Well, not only a pro- prolific author, but the co-host of the Mortification of Spin podcast with Todd Pruitt and mm. uh, Carl Truman. Mm-hmm. Even though you guys are Presbyterians, I still really enjoy <laughs> listening. <laughs> Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's got a Presbyterian flavor to it. Doesn't a little it? bit. Yeah, I mean we're Southern Baptists, so it's okay. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it's okay. Oh man, well, Amy, uh, it is an a pleasure to to have you on. Uh, we're excited to kind of talk about our topic for today. But first, we need to introduce you to our audience a little bit. So we love for you to just dive into a little bit of just tell us a little bit about who you are. What I guess first off, like what what is your faith background? Um, well, I grew up Southern Baptist, okay. so that is my faith background. Um, You're always welcome my, home. <laughs> yeah, my family is Southern Baptist, and um, my husband grew up Roman Catholic. Okay. Okay. So um, we were trying to figure out what we were. Um, I, you know, I'm married at 21 years old, um, and so we did start out at the Baptist church because we definitely were not going to be Roman Catholic, mm. and we were there. We were at a, a, a pretty it was a church plant. So it had such a great community. We loved the community at that church, but, um, through our marriage, yeah, we found ourselves, um, we discovered that we're Presbyterian. So (laughs) we, uh, ended up when we moved to West Virginia for 11 years, we were at, so we were at a Baptist church for seven years, uh, West Virginia, 11 years, we were at a PCA church and now we have moved back to Frederick, Maryland, and we have we are members of an OPC church, Orthodox Presbyterian church Mm -hmm. um, here in Frederick, which uh, we love. It's a wonderful church, wonderful people. And um, yeah, I, I like the Presbyterian government. I I like having our confessions, Yeah, Um, Mm -hmm. but every denomination has its issues, of course. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you are also, you're, you're a, you're a wife, but you're also a mom Mm -hmm. as well. How many kids? Yes. I have three kids. Okay. I have um, my oldest is turning 20 this summer. She's going into her junior year of college. Um, my second daughter is going into her senior year of high school in the fall. Okay. And my son will be going into his freshman year of high school in the That's fall. That's awesome. So been married for 22 years. Um, so yeah, that could, went by in a blink of an eye. Wow, it just goes by so quickly. I I recently just had a little girl in April, and so she's already Aww, she's congratulations. Already, she's getting so big. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she is. Yeah, Ooh. he's a monster. No I'm kidding. <laughs> 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 oh my gosh! But so, Amy, uh, the most important question we ask our guests: mm-hmm. Are you yes. a coffee drinker? Oh my goodness! I used to own a coffee shop. Whoa! Whoa wait, what? Okay. Yeah, way in the beginning of my marriage. Okay. Like, uh, so my yeah, I was. As soon as I graduated from college, I got married and um, I decided, you know, I don't really want to be an educator like I majored in. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to open a coffee shop. And my husband thought that was awesome. So I opened up a coffee shop. I co-owned it with my mother. So we went in as partners, wow. um, downtown Frederick. It was so much fun. Loved mm. it. Met so many people because we sold like Christian books there and- sure. um, we had, it wasn't a Christian coffee shop, right? but um, we sold Christian books there. Sometimes we would have Christian entertainment on Saturday nights, yeah. you know, mm. mixed in with the classic rock <laughs> and other stuff we had going on. And um, so people from all different denominations just caught on to the fact that there was a, a Christian owned business, I guess. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was like amazing because 
even a lot of Roman Catholics went there too. Okay. And um, mm. I just met so many different people from yeah. different denominations. And so it really helped smash a lot of the stereotypes that I had in my head mm. um, as a, you know, young woman in my twenties. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. That's really cool. It was so much fun. Loved it. I, I, I'm, what kind of co- what's your favorite coffee? I got to know now. <laughs> you know, I think my favorite is, is just an Americano, which is the shot mm. of espresso mm-hmm. with hot water in it. Yes. Yes. <laughs> the mark, the mark for me of a good coffee shop is can they make a good Americano? Yes, it is. Yes. It That's is. same with me. If they... And you know how many coffee shops I've been in yes. that when I order Americano, they don't even know what it is. Yeah. Are you serious? They don't even know. So wow. many. I've been in one or two. What? Uh-huh. Yeah. What? Don't t- and I have tell to me the tell name them. Afterwards. Okay. I don't want to go to them if they can't make a good Americano. Yeah, that's it's my coffee. Insane. It's fair. It's fair. Well, oh, I'm man. glad we agree on this important yeah, topic. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're in agreement there. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right. So, Amy, we, we have you on to talk about, a, I think, a relevant topic, at least right now, at least for Southern Baptists right now. Mm, yes. <laughs> Unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. It's I'd the say big... for everyone all the time. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> we're, we're having you on to talk about... Um, gender roles mm. but most specifically uh you're you're an author you've written a book called Housewife theologian and mm. also why can't we be friends um mm-hmm. and so your new book coming out uh by zondervan is there a, is there a publishing date for that uh i think march 2020 okay march 2020 okay mark your calendars guys this is going to be a really good book uh your new book is called recovering from biblical manhood and womanhood. Mm. It's a provocative mm-hmm. title for many reasons. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. One of which is because it literally plays on the recovering biblical manhood of womanhood from Mr. John Piper mm. and Mr. Wayne Crudo, uh, the eminent theologians of the Reformed tradition. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you you wrote this book, Recovering from Biblical Manhood of Womanhood, obviously as kind of a play on that book was that was published all those years ago. Um, mm-hmm. I guess I'm wondering, uh, why did you decide to write the book now? And then we can maybe go back into the history of the biblical manhood and womanhood movement. But I really want to know why, why you felt the need to write the book mm. right now. Yeah. Um, honestly, I didn't begin with, you know, this tongue in cheek title and, um, and I didn't begin wanting to even get into all the critiquing of the movement of yeah. biblical manhood and womanhood. i much rather present something more biblical and beautiful. Right. Um, but the more I started working on what I wanted to write, I realized that you really need to address the issue head on. Mm. Yeah. And, um, and the issue, like everybody wants to be biblical, right. right? I mean, I want to be biblical as a woman. It sounds like such a good thing, biblical yeah. womanhood. And, you know, when I married at 21 years old, that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a good biblical wife. I wanted to be, you know, the good conservative. Right. Mm. Um, And so I was soaking up all these resources that were pretty new um, then. And I, and I got that book recovering biblical manhood and womanhood. Right. Um, There were some areas where I was stubbing my toe there in the book, but I thought, you know, I really respect John Piper and Wayne Grudem. I really, right. you know, have learned a lot from their teaching in a lot of different areas. Mm-hmm. And, and so I looked past my own, what I would think at the time was immature reading um, to, to try to learn from these men mm. and these great leaders even. And so what I'm noticing now is the movement has grown as it has, and they've built off of those teachings in the book. And mm-hmm. then I've gone back to the book as I'm working on, on my, my new material is that, um, you know, you can't just put biblical in front of a word and then we can all assume that that one way is the biblical way, mm. especially when, um, you know, we, and we also have to have discernment realizing this is a movement. This is a very popular movement. It's a very new movement. You know, yeah. it's like 30 years old. Yeah. Um, and so these leaders need to keep having things to talk about in their movement. Right. And they've, they've built on these ideas in the book, which are very concerning. Uh, one major um, teaching in the book that um, is a real problem in, in which complementarianism as a movement was built upon is um, an orth- unorthodox teaching on the Trinity. Mm-hmm. And yes. so in the book, there's a teaching yep. that um, the son, the second person of the Trinity, 
um, is eternally subordinate to the father in his very essence. Mm. Um, and then they use that teaching to then teach that the woman, since she's created second, is eternally subordinate to the man. Mm. And um, our confessions, but both Baptists and um, Presbyterians and even Roman Catholics will confess from Nicene Trinitarianism yeah. mm. um, mm -hmm. teaches differently. So, in, you know, everybody agrees that Nicene, Nicene Trinitarianism is Orthodox Christianity. Right, so we yeah. have to get that right. It's very important. So I, I, don't, I don't want to say, oh, you know, these, these men are heretics or anything like that. What I'm saying is some of the teaching is unorthodox. And, and matter of fact, this is some of the foundational teaching that complementarianism was built on. Mm, absolutely. We need to go back and look at, and even, I mean, I've, I've got here like the defi very definitions that they have from uh, what is masculine and what is feminine, mature masculinity mm -hmm. and mature femininity um, is also an issue. Um, so John Piper writes in the book, at the heart of mature masculinity is a sense of benevolent responsibility to lead, provide for, and protect women in ways appropriate to a man's differing relationships. At the heart of mature femininity is a freeing disposition to affirm, receive, and nurture strength and leadership from worthy men in ways appropriate to a woman's differing relationships. So, I mean, I look at these definitions and I see there's an echo of the ESS teaching, eternal subordination, mm -hmm. within their very definitions of biblical manhood and womanhood. Men's roles are active and, and potent and, and women are kind of parasitic to that and subservient to that. Mm. So the, the heart of femininity merely means being masculinity affirmers. Mm. Mm. And I think that um, scripture teaches something much more beautiful mm. than that, much bigger of a picture of manhood and womanhood. Mm. Um, and, you know, I agree with them that there are distinctions between the sexes that are very important. Yeah. And, um, and I agree with them that we need, as the church, we need to be able to speak against what the culture is defining as mm. masculinity and femininity and all the fluidity that they're saying mm. is within it and, and how there is a lot of androgynous teaching going on. And I agree with them I, that that is wrong and unbiblical. Mm. Um, but what they're teaching about manhood and womanhood, I have a lot of differences with when I'm looking at scripture. Absolutely. Um, and so just to kind of put this into a context when we're talking about biblical manhood and womanhood, when we're talking about complementarianism, this was a movement that started back in the late 1980s. Mm. Um, a, a group of men met together, John Piper, Wayne Grudem among them, um, <clears throat> who came together and uh, drew up um, the Danvers Statement mm -hmm. on Biblical Manhood and mm -hmm. Womanhood, a good statement. Yeah, a good statement. Um, yeah. And then they formed the Council on Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Um, the organization is now run by Denny Burke, who is really cool. I kind of like. I kind of like Denny. He's a good dude. Uh, he's a good dude. Um, but he is currently the head of the CBMW, as they as they appropriately affectionately uh, acronym themselves uh, for mm -hmm. sake of brevity and clarity. Um, mm. But uh, for for that, so. The, the movement of biblical manhood and womanhood started back in the 1980s, mm -hmm. and they defined themselves as complementarianism. Mm -hmm. And so, Amy, would you be able to define for us complementarianism? Maybe not as they, <laughs> not as they define it, maybe. Question. But yeah. um, or maybe you could define it as they probably define it in the book. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, well, and that's another interesting thing, because as it was defined, and Mary Kyson has a, 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 on their blog, has a definition of it, um, and it's, I don't want to say it that I'm saying it word for word because I'm not, but um, I agree where they say that complementarianism um, affirms distinctness between the male and the female, mm -hmm. and um, and you know they use the word that we're we're equal in being, um, but they say that man has something to picture to the world about how Christ loves the church, and woman has something to picture to the world about how. Um, you know, mm. for the church yeah. and there's a gospel picture there, but um, they also, she also includes in there that it's also picturing God's relationship to Christ. Mm. And um, that right there is the doorway where I'm saying, this is where their ESS is showing. Yeah. Mm. 
um, the father's relationship with the son is kind of within their own definition of complementarianism. They used to have on their website their statement on the Trinity, which had ESS in it. So I, um, you know, I think complementarity is a, a good word yeah. and a good thing. Sure. Um, but um, they use words such as roles mm -hmm. um, between men and women that can be very confusing because, um, you know, the word role comes from the theater. It's something, you know, it's a part that you play. Sure. It's temporary. Mm -hmm. um, so they use the word role as some sort of ontological essence of who we are. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. woman's role is to always be subservient to the man. The man's mm -hmm. role is to always have authority over the woman. Um, I don't think those are roles. Mm -hmm. So that's where I would, you know, there's several areas where I would definitely differ from how complementarians define themselves. Some people like to say, well, complementarian can merely mean that um, we affirm male ordination only mm -hmm. and male headship in the home. Um, but yeah, it, it's such a loose term now. It means so many different things. Right. And mm -hmm. same with egalitarianism. Uh, you yeah. know, and talking to a lot of egalitarians, you know, I thought it meant one thing. And interestingly, they have a whole range of their own ideas of what egalitarian is as well. There's a huge spectrum. Mm. Um, so I don't know how helpful these terms are anymore. I think we need to be more specific in, in our language and, um, and definitely uh, you know, use our confessions with that yeah. too. But um, yeah, so I don't even know what it means anymore. Yeah, it's yeah. a movement it's, really. It's, it's a lot like the word evangelical. What does that even mean yeah. anymore to people? Um, yeah. So, I think that's good. And so just to kind of help people define that a little bit further, complementarianism is 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 a is a is a theological framework of thinking about mm -hmm. men and women and um, how they interact with each other, not only in the church but in the home. Mm -hmm. um, the The idea is that they complement each other. There it is. Uh, the, the, <laughs> and the, complement not with an I, like right, you know, we right, nice you know, things about each other. Like, but oh, you look very good today. <clears throat> oh, that should you. be a part of it. Though, that right? should, it should be honestly, yeah. yeah. Um, and then it's normally contrasted with egalitarianism which is what you brought up, which is the, mm -hmm. there is no such thing as a role. Um, when and women are free to be the leader in any type of mm -hmm. situation. Mm -hmm. and, and that includes, I think, unbiblically, the role of elder in the church. Um, and so yeah. you see a lot of egalitarian churches yeah. like the UMC, United Methodist Church, with, yeah. with yeah. Um, female elders and uh, ordained priests, which I think we, I think we, I think as a starting ground, we all agree that only men, the role of elder is reserved for men. I think we mm -hmm. all agree on yeah, that. Yeah. Um, Which is so interesting because that's now up for debate. Is it's, it? Yeah. Where? Everywhere. Oh. <laughs> yeah, everywhere. <laughs> no, I've seen it a lot in the Southern Baptist world right now. It's a conversation about it. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it's you a call out a conversation. <laughs> On Twitter, on, on Twitter, no. Twitter, it's, <laughs> on Twitter, no. It's more, it's a, it's always a dumpster fire on Twitter. But oh no. my gosh, yes. I think the the bait in the Southern Baptist is a little bit different than kind of the. I don't know. We could talk about that a little bit. But yeah, yeah, um, yeah. but Amy, just to kind of give us a ten thousand foot view, then uh, just kind of going all the way back to the beginning, just to provide mm -hmm. a helpful foundation or framework for people. We read in Genesis one. Uh, 26 and 27. Actually, no, I'm going to do in 27. Uh, mm -hmm. So God created man in his own image. Mm -hmm. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Yeah. Going back to the very beginning then, if, if, mm -hmm. if, if we find the movement of complementarianism and, e and egalitarianism insufficient to answer the questions of what is a man, what is a woman, if we find the, uh, the book biblical manhood and womanhood insufficient to answer the questions. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to the beginning of Genesis. And so yeah. what do we mean when we say God created them male and female? Mm -hmm. What do we mean yeah, when we say so that? There's two different ways that human beings image God. Mm -hmm. um, we're sexually installed as male or female, mm -hmm. um, our body and soul together. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the question becomes what is what is distinct then mm -hmm. about like me and my womanhood um especially since and and cbnw makes this point woman was created second what does that mean um and i do not see in genesis one or two some sort of hierarchy made here out of this 
Um, and if you look at that in light of its Levitical context, in light of all of scripture, um, there's, much, there's something much more beautiful being pictured here. Here's Adam created, right, as a man. Yeah. Um, why did God create woman second? Why did he create animal life in between? You know, what is going mm. on here? Um, you know, and as Adam is naming the animals, he sees something. He sees that they can't respond to him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He has no reciprocity with animal life in that way. Yeah. Um, they, they don't contribute intellectually or spiritually, right? Um, or theologically. So yeah. when, when God creates woman, Adam has to sacrifice. He's put down, right? It's like he's put to sleep. Yeah. Um, and she creates, he creates woman from man's very side. So what does, what does Adam see when he is awakened and behold, here's this woman? Yeah. Um, he sees his telos. He sees mm -hmm. his ultimate purpose, his mm -hmm. end, the bride of Christ the church flowing from Christ's side, mm. you know, that, that's the picture that mm. we see there. So uh, God didn't create man and woman at the same time for a reason. He didn't create two men for a reason. Um, mm. He created her second as an eschatological marker. Mm. Um, the second is the glory of the first. We see Paul saying that uh, woman is the glory of man. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mark Garcia has done some some good work on that um, and on woman being man's eschatological glory. Mm -hmm. So instead of reducing her, that elevates her. And she's also then a liturgical responder to Adam. And so there's this very um, sacred context in the garden temple of Eden um, before the fall. There isn't a separation of common life. Um, they're in a sanctuary. They're in a garden sanctuary. Mm -hmm. So this is a very liturgical, um, a liturgical thing yeah. and a liturgical reading that the original hearers and readers of Genesis are going to see since mm -hmm. it's within the whole Levitical context in which they live. So, um, and, and, that, and, and that makes sense when, when you consider that God has made a helper and the original Hebrew is... Uh, Ezer, Ezer, yeah. I don't kind of yeah. quite know how to pronounce it, but yeah. it, it it means helper. But it, it's not just like a oh, let me help you do the dishes. Right. It's right. it's a uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I'm gonna help you in this battle because without me, you're gonna lose this battle. Yeah, it's, it, right. It is... I mean, helper is I think a poor translation in our time sure. now. Yeah. Because we we look at that word as an inferior word. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, yeah. That's a good point. And really, what it is, it's a corresponding strength. Yeah. Um, the, you know, the word e Ezer or Azer, however you want to say it, is used in the Old Testament um, to describe God as mm -hmm. Israel's savior, like right. it, it, mm. a lot of times saturated in military language. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So I, she's a necessary ally to man, sure. not a, you know, inferior subordinate. Mm. She, she's not a second thought. Yeah. Yeah. She's not, um, and she's necessary to yeah. man. Yeah. She's not, uh, you know, well, can you help me get these supplies? <laughs> can, you have, <laughs> can you please pass the sugar? You know, like it's, he needs her. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I always, I always heard that translated growing up, uh, translated life saver. Oh, Evil, interesting. Yeah, uh, grew up in a pa uh, pastor's house, and so he had mm -hmm. tons and tons of books, and he <laughs> pointed that out. But he said it's better to think not just a helper come alongside, but a life saver. The wife, Eve, the wife of a man, is there to literally save his life in multiple mm -hmm. areas uh of how he like how he functions and help him live for god not not help him just live for him and so mm -hmm. that thought was really interesting that you mentioned that and you know you're right it's a picture of god in the old testament it's so so beautiful mm -hmm. and this is a great conversation for me uh just about to step into marriage we've had these discussions about uh as you put in quotations roles and distinctiveness and and going into marriage and I think we, we both agree that relationships, male and female, are, are distinct and different in the church and home. Uh, men are supposed to be pastors and leaders in their homes and wives uh, to help, save, sustain, submit to that leadership in a biblical perspective. Uh, and I'm careful using that word biblical now. Yeah. yeah. Hey. <laughs> um, but just like kind of discussing what that looks like in your house because it looks different for every person. But it's kind of those in those, uh, those realms. 
and we just read it's rooted in Genesis 1 and 2. Um, but the real question now has come up, especially starting back in 2015, is what does that look like when it comes to uh, all areas of life, like especially when it comes to like civil service or civil society? Uh, so I remember uh, your boy, John Piper, wrote an article a couple <laughs> uh, was it about a couple of years ago. Yeah, it was a couple of years ago. Uh, about whether women can be police officers. And he mm-hmm. made a strong uh, statement. Put it like that. He 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 set his, his <laughs> flag on the hill. Right, he did. I this, was like, "This is this is my hill." And I was like, "Okay, yeah, all right, like, we're going with this yeah, now." <laughs> yeah, uh, he, he set his flag on the hill and claimed that it shouldn't be a role that a woman should play. If I can use that that language in this realm, it's not a uh, her. It's not where she should be serving. I think his approach was, if I remember correctly, you can tell me if I'm wrong, was like the men should step up more in order to step into the realm of civil service as far as being a cop or like in the military yeah to the point where women don't have to do that right i think that mm-hmm. was i think that was the point and yeah. i think um and i think that is the big question though because i think uh, a lot of people agree um especially within our within our circles that mm-hmm. um the role of of men and women are uh, there is a distinction, especially in the church and especially in um, the home uh, when it mm-hmm. comes to elder and when it comes to leader in the home. But I think the, the bigger question then comes into, do those roles extend outward yeah. into the rest of society? Um, if they do, um, how? <laughs> <laughs> Does that make sense? So is that what you're asking me? Yeah, we're asking <laughs> you. <laughs> okay, well, um, yeah, I think that we use words that are in scripture, like head, headship, um, and people are using them to mean different things. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of important to, to define our terms, even what do we mean by that? And when yeah. we look at Ephesians 5, um, the language is very, um, you know, Paul's talking about the head and the body. Mm-hmm. And um, I really look at that doctrine, too, of the whole Christ, like the church makes up the whole Christ. We're so united to him Mm. that we are thought of as his body. Mm. And so um, when man and woman join in holy matrimony, um, that's how united we are. Yeah. And in the in the secular world, we think of, you know, the heads and the, the rulers and the body is to sacrifice itself for the head. But Paul's saying the opposite here. Mm. Um, he's saying you are to serve your wife. You are to serve her with your very life. Mm -hmm. Um, you Mm -hmm. are to get underneath and you are to elevate her, um, in this mission that I've called you to, you are to make sure (laughs) that she, uh, you, you're to give her everything you can in your power to, um, to her end, which Mm. is to be totally sanctified in me. So, and we see that in Genesis too. Mm-hmm. We see man is the one who has to sacrifice himself um, for wo- woman's creation. We see that um, man is called to to leave his family mm-hmm. and cling to his wife, mm-hmm. which is exactly what Christ did, right? He left heaven itself mm-hmm. in the incarnation um, to cling to his bride. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and, you know, gave his very life for her. So I think that when we always want to define it in terms of authority and submission. I'm not saying that there's not authority and submission, but to, to flatten it that way, um, that's a thin complementarianism to me. Mm. You know, I've been called a thin complementarianism because I think women can be cops. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I think that that is actually the thin complementarianism. Uh-huh. Um, mm. To flatten it like that. Um, being married 22 years, um, I can see that the more we have grown in Christ, the more we have sacrificed for one another, Mm. um, you know, this flattening of when you really push, what does it mean that you're the head and have the whole authority to, to the complementarian and complementarians who really want to put it in that framework all the time. Um, it really comes down to, uh, man makes the final decision. If there's a disagreement, I mean, that's where, like, if you keep pushing and keep pushing, that's where it ends. Yeah. And, um, you know, what I've seen in a mature marriage really is you very rarely get to it. Both of you want to work things out. Both Mm -hmm. of you want to submit for one another. Um, and we communicate to one another, we hash things out. Um, yes, we sin in that, but, um, 
then we ask for forgiveness, right? And, yeah. and we grow through all mm -hmm. of it. Um, I think that that's where actual growth happens, not in, I say this, you have to do this. Mm. Um, that's not serving yeah. your wife either. So, um, you know, the way that we talk about those things within marriage, I think is very important. Um, and then when we use a word like authority, um, authority has been used as a blank word for like power mm. and just means I have direction and power over you. And so like John Piper says that the reason why, you know, he doesn't think that women should have some of these, um, some of these jobs in society is because, um, what he says to the point that a woman's, um, to the degree that a woman's influence over a man is personal and directive, it will generally offend, offend a man's good, God-given sense of responsibility and leadership, and thus controvert God's created order. Um, so women aren't to have personal and directive um, influence mm -hmm. over a man, according to him. And so in the book, it plays out in the weirdest ways in culture, because like um, whether you know, how a man should properly ask for directions from a woman if he's lost um, because she's a woman and, you know, right. you know he, mm. he needs directions, but then that's direct and personal guidance. So, or, um, you know, how a man holds a woman, like how a husband holds his wife's purse or who's the one driving the car when they're together or who orders for who in a restaurant. Like this gets a little ridiculous. Mm. Um, whereas authority is merely authorization. And it's not blanket authorization in all of life. It's an authorization for a, a specific task. Mm -hmm. So um, women are authorized to do all kinds of things <laughs> in scripture yeah. as well. It doesn't mean she has, you know, some direct influence over men all the time. But, um, you know, when Paul authorizes Phoebe to, to deliver the letter to the Romans mm -hmm. um, under his authority, like, that's an authorization. There's plenty of that in scripture. Now, I do think that women represents as eschatological glory she represents um like bucolic age of feasting and um peace yeah. right so it is odd when we see deborah go to war mm -hmm. but it's not prescriptive she's not sinning and going to war she's doing the god's she's doing god's will there mm -hmm. so um you know in general i do think you know, men are the ones who sacrifice their, their very lives for women. Women are created with a vulnerability in the fact that we, um, we bear and nurture new life, Yeah. right? Mm. And um, so we sacrifice our own bodies in that way. And, and that makes us vulnerable. Um, men are created with more muscle mass and, and, and they're taller and their, bone, their bones are more dense, right? And, mm. and, and in these ways, you are equipped to help provide and protect um, for women who are more vulnerable in that way. Now, does that mean that women aren't called to strength or that men aren't called to nurture? No, we look to each other for those things and, mm, and we, yeah. both, we both give in those ways, but we're specially equipped in other ways. Mm. So um, there is something very distinct and mm. that plays out in all of life. Like I will agree that it's not like I turn off my womanhood when I go into culture. Um, I do everything as a woman and yeah. I don't have to, um, think of all the ways to be feminine. Mm. I am feminine because I'm sexually installed as a woman. Mm. So everything that I do is feminine mm. and it's a feminine contribution. Um, Julian Marius has written some really good philosophical theological work on the distinctions between men and women. Mm. And he talks about how men and women co-implicate one another. So, um, and, and we also complicate one another in that way. So when, we, when I look to men, I learn more about what it means for me to be a woman and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, so we really need to invest in mutual knowledge of one another because we are actually faced towards one another in a way that is supposed to be dynamic and moving towards the future. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that there's a lot to think about there. Not only do, 
the distinctions between men and women, but our own unique contributions that we have as individual human beings. Yeah. So, yeah. and you, and I think you're, you're quick to make that there, there is a distinction between men and women, uh, mm -hmm. sexually Absolutely. and, yes. and, 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 and bodily, like you, you said, men have much more muscle mass and bone structure and women are much more vulnerable in the sense that they can uh, create and bear life mm -hmm. within them and, and, mm -hmm. and sustain that life. And uh, our bodies are made to do that. Your bodies yeah. are made to do that. And so I, I think the, the big discussion though, especially what came up in uh, a couple years ago was, um, there, there. People are trying to apply these distinctions of yeah, gender, yeah. Uh, not only in the church, but they're trying to apply it uh, in uh, the outside world around them. You're quick to make that distinction, but I'm, I'm wondering where do we draw the line of, of saying, okay, uh, the, the role of church stops here, or the role of the home mm -hmm. uh, stops here, um, and, and, and I think the application is a little muddy, especially yeah. when it comes to complementarian circles. So how do we unmuddy those waters of like, there are distinctions and we should uh, accept that, but yeah. how do we apply that in everyday life? Yeah. And there are distinctions across the board between men and women, whether we're talking about church, home or society, there, yeah. we are distinct as men and women. Um, but when we're talking about something like, let's say authority, um, we need to look at what, who are we authorized from? Mm -hmm. What are we authorized to do specifically? So when we're talking about church and eldership, you know, this is authorization mm -hmm. from the Lord, right? In a specific task, like my pastor yeah. does have um, a specific authority, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Over me in my church and my elders, but he doesn't have authority, like to tell me what to wear today or what to eat or what to say to my husband, you know, mm -hmm. like, um, he has specific authority. He doesn't have full blanket authority over my life. Yeah. Um, so we need to look at what it is they're authorized to do. What is a husband mm. authorized to do in his home? What is a yeah. wife authorized to do in her home? And then when we look at um, vocation in uh, culture, what is the authorization to do? How mm. does our distinctness as men and women help contribute in that area? In, in all three areas, is there reciprocity? Mm. Is there dynamism? Is there growth? Um, because, and here's a big difference between um, CBMW complementarianism and what I'm saying about men and women, is they have what uh, Pope John II calls fractional complementarianism. Um, so Sister Prudence Allen has written like three huge volumes on the concept of women throughout history and philosophy and theology. Highly recommend it. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, there are Roman Catholic bones to spit out while you're it's reading a, it, but it's a, there's a lot of good stuff so, in there. Sounds like a good late night read. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> late night read, yeah. Well, anyway, uh, so CBMW complementarianism is very fractional. Mm -hmm. It's one half plus one half equals one whole, mm. okay? Mm. But we're whole persons. So um, what Pope John Paul, Paul II proposes is that we're, we're one whole plus one whole, which equals three we actually create fruit in our dynamism together as men and women. So you see that in marriage as the fruit of offspring. I mean, uh, we actually create other beings, mm -hmm. but that, all, that picture also plays in the church life and in culture and our vocations and our neighboring um, men and women produce fruitfulness um, in our res reciprocity and communion um, before one another. Mm. That's, that's interesting. I that might be a late night read indeed. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, when we're talking about something like, um, let's say, police work, okay. um, there are physical limitations to women, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm yeah. not pretending like there aren't. Um, but there are also definite contributions that are specifically feminine and helpful in a vocation such as that. Mm. Um, and uh, when they're working with children, when they're working with other women, and as men learning how to relate to other women. And, yeah. you know, I don't want to overgeneralize uh, women's strengths and men's strengths, um, psychologically speaking. Right. But we do have, you know, since women are created as nurturers, um, we do have what's called an emotional intelligence. A lot of us do, not everyone. Um, like, for instance, you know, my husband, you look at him and he drives a pickup truck and he looks, you know, he's got a beard and he's like the manly man. Look to him, you would say. Mm -hmm. But he's also an elementary school teacher. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. he's also like way more nurturing than me. I, I like, have learned a lot um, 
from my husband in that way. I thought I was a nurturing person, <laughs> but yeah. um, you know, I, I've learned a lot of, and, and it, when you look at the virtues in scripture, well, let's say a uh, sermon on the Mount, like blessed are those, um, the Beatitudes, um, gentleness, mm. right? Um, those who weep with others, <laughs> you yeah. know, these sound very feminine, but they're not um, feminine virtues. Mm. They're just virtues yeah. that we're all called to in Christ-likeness. Mm. Yeah. So, so I think we, we, we kind of established the, the role of, of the pastor as authoritative, um, given authority by God to preach the word, mm-hmm. proclaim his word, um, yeah. be a minister of the sacraments. And shepherd. And shepherd, know, shepherd, and shepherd the flock, everything. protect it. Yeah. Um, so let's, let's talk about headship then mm. uh you know come on this is this is this is my topic nothing a little you know not as controversial um <laughs> but let's talk about headship because you you've written a lot about about this word and especially as it relates to um Ephesians 5 and I kind of want to quickly just kind of go mm-hmm. read that just for a quick second um just so we're all on the same page I'm looking at Ephesians 5 mm. uh 22 through blah 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 uh 27 uh, no, 28. No, I'll just I'll just read and I'll just stop. OK, <laughs> Ephesians 5, starting in verse 22. Wives, this is the elect standard version, ESV. Uh, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body. And he himself is his, is its savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit mm-hmm. in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the words that he might present the church to himself mm. in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that he might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members mm. of his body. So we there's a lot of headship words being thrown around there and I kind of really want to dive into what does this what does this look like practically uh, I guess theologically and then let's talk about what it looks like practically in mm-hmm. the home mm-hmm. yeah I'm um, theologically there's a lot of argument over what this word means here in this context it, um, you know one side says it's authority it means authority okay and another side says it means source uh, woman is the sort man is the source of the woman just like the incarnate Christ, um, you know, came from the father. Yeah. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if we even need to get caught up in all of those arguments okay. because it shows us practically what it means in, in the, in the verse there. And, mm. and the focus is being one flesh. Mm. Um, and if you keep reading like verse 31, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother mm, yeah. and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Mm-hmm. He keeps talking about, um, the body. Yeah. And, and so what it looks like practically, and, and if you go back to Genesis two, um, you see at the curse, um, woman is told your desire, you know, even though I just told you, you're going to be giving childbirth through pain and labor, um, your desire is still going to be towards your husband. Mm-hmm. Um, and he's going to rule over you. But in these verses, nowhere does it say, uh, okay, this is how you be the head uh, yeah, yeah. by ruling over your wife. He's not saying rule over her. He's saying love her, mm-hmm. love her, serve her. Um, you know, now that we have the gospel and we have this picture of Christ's love for his church, um, we're, we're, we're moving forward here. This is what yeah. I've created um, marriage for mm. to to picture this, and so um, it's by loving, it's by sacrificing your your own self because now you're united, you're one flesh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so give yourself for her, love her, provide and care for her. Um, there's a much bigger description here on how the husband is to love his wife than how the wife is to love her husband, mm-hmm. and and he's telling the wives look, I'm not telling you to rule over your husband either. Like after the gospel, you know, and and your new creations, that doesn't mean now you can rule your husband. Um, Don't subvert this love that Mm. I'm calling them to Mm. um, for you. That makes them vulnerable, right? Mm. I could become some big bossy tyrant. (laughs) You're supposed to love me. No, submit to this. 
Um, you know, and, and ahead of there in verse 21, he's saying, submit yourselves to one another mm. in the fear of mm. Christ. And, and I see that being played out here in, in the wives and husbands, because I don't know anything more submissive than sacrificing your own life for mm-hmm. another person. Mm. I don't know anything more submissive than living your life for another person. I mean, yeah. that's huge. Yeah. And um, so it's, it's huge also to tell the wife, don't subvert this. Don't sabotage this. Yeah. Submit to this. Submit to this love. You know, um, it's a beautiful picture. Yeah. 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 And like you said, it points to an, an eschatological or a future oriented. Yeah reality of the coming kingdom yeah. of, of, of the sacrifice and this laying down of your life um, for right. the other. And as we're kind of uh, beginning to kind of wrap up our, our conversation, this has been a really excellent conversation. It I have, uh, have learned a lot. It's, it's pushed some <laughs> buttons and I'm, re- I'm really glad for that. Um, but you have a, you, I mean, I, I love and respect John Piper and, and Wayne Grudem, mm-hmm. you know. Um, I, yeah. I, I, I don't want it to come across like this is a John Piper, Wayne Grudem bashing episode. No. <laughs> Matter of fact, we would love to have you on the podcast. Hit us up, coffeeandcreampodcast.com. <laughs> but, uh, so there are significant disagreements, but I really want to – what are some areas in which you you agree with them? Maybe they get something right mm-hmm. on, on the mm-hmm. issue of, of manhood mm-hmm. and womanhood. What What is that thing? Mm-hmm. And so from that – how can we disagree with 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 people on this subject well, especially on this issue of complementarianism? Right. Um, well, I mean, I think that I, I mean, I certainly agree with them that man and woman are both valuable image bearers of God mm-hmm. um, and that we are created distinct yeah. as men and as women. And um, I agree with them that it's very important for us to get this right. And um that we need to be, the church needs to be where culture sees something different, right? Yeah. Uh, where they do see something biblical. I agree with them that we need to be biblical. Um, but, you know, one, one thing that I think we really need to think about in moving forward is the actual language that we're using. And I feel like um, the church has gotten so caught up in talking to the culture about this that we're actually using the same terms as a secular culture Mm -hmm. so when we use language such as equality and rights um and you know egalitarians and want to talk about equality and rights and and complementarians want to say well yeah yeah we believe that man and women are are equal in value and there's room for this kind of language but Mm -hmm. really we're not the same Mm -hmm. um so when we say equal we have to be very um detailed about what we're talking about there i agree with Piper and Grudem that we're not the same. And so we're not equal in that way. We have distinct contributions um, that are of value as as men and women. Mm. Um, So I think that we need to think about the terms that we're using. And instead of using all the the secular language, Mm. um, such as equality and rights, and even complementarianism and egalitarianism, I think it would be much more helpful to um, kind of step back, like you said, and use that 10,000 foot view Mm. and um, look at the whole meta narrative Mm. that we have in scripture and do more of a biblical theology and not so much of a biblicism in our biblical interpretation. Yeah. Um, And so within our interpretive communities of our church, we need to be having these conversations um, and maybe without so much being led by fear, I think there's so much fear and where we're going to go if we talk mm. about this. Yeah. Okay. Um, That's real. If, if, if we're being biblical and, and if we're following um, the structures that we have within our own church, we have leadership in our church that we are to submit to. Right. Um, then I think we can have really good conversations within that framework. And then we can look at outside sources such as CBMW's resources mm. or, um, or, or my resources that I'm doing and, and many other people. Um, and, and we read them with discernment. Yeah. 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 Right. Quick, quick plug for your stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I'm saying read me with discernment, just like read them with yeah, discernment sure. is yeah. what I'm saying. Um, yeah. We shouldn't look to parachurch as some sort of um, ultimate authority. Um, the resources. Yeah. yeah. That's good. Yeah. I, th- I think, 
I hundred thousand percent agree with we need to really define terms. Yeah. Because I think that has been lost not just in this conversation, but in conversations about race, sexuality. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. About what justice is. Like the word mm-hmm. justice is literally needs to be defined mm-hmm. again and again <laughs> and again. Because we're talking again. past one another, aren't yeah, we? Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. And that's why I get on Twitter and just laugh at all the arguments. <laughs> like, come on, coffee and cream, let's have a real conversation. Um, but I, I 100% agree with you because the, the de- definition of terms is going to drive our actions. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think you are right to 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 call the church to be not only the leaders of defining things, defining those terms, but also be the leaders in creating a place for women to actually not only say what they need to say, but be heard. Not just mm-hmm. have a place where like, they share their thoughts and they kind of fade away, but actually be heard, <laughs> valued, uh, yeah. and have their gifts, whatever it may be, utilized. And so. I, I guess my question then would be, how can churches do that well? Yeah. Because there's a lot of conversation on doing that. such a good question. Yeah. And, you know, um, sometimes elders will, um, you know, ask to consult with, with me on some, you know, after reading No Little Women, um, which is about kind of written towards church officers yeah. mm. to help equip women in the church. Mm. Um, you know, they might read that and say, okay, well, help us in this specific context, in this specific situation. And I do see that the language so much revolves around equality and rights and all these things. Um, And so therefore it's kind of a distraction of how we can really move Mm. past. And, and my book, like my upcoming one and and, and that one as well, it's, it's written about the rest of the 98% of the church. It's not written about whether women can Mm. be ordained. Yeah. It's, it's definitely, it's about what do lay people do? Yeah. And, um, and so as a lay woman, do I have, should I be invested in less than a lay man? Mm. Um, and I think this is really important for church officers to think about, and they have to be the ones to lead the way. Mm. And so many women that I talk about that are um, you know, really struggling with their place in the church do not want to cause any trouble. They don't want to make any waves. You know, they want yeah. to be submissive to their church leadership, um, and they want to do this right. And, and the question is, you know, we value the women's um culinary contributions in the church right hey, hey, we hey. value oh, yes, we the do. women's <laughs> yes, babysitting do. contributions in the church and sunday school and nursery and all of that um and training little children um but do we value the woman's theological contributions mm. do we va- value her voice mm. um do we look to her, to her interpretations do we look to her testimonies mm-hmm. do we look to her wisdom um any in the church, yeah, and and, and how does that show? Mm. And so, you know, one um, leader told me, so I was talking to him. He's like, you know, I really see an issue with um, in my own church in my own life that we need more elders, we need more um, pastors, and so when we see a man with theological vigor, we invest in him right away. Mm. And um, we, you know, go into heavy discipleship yeah. training. Um, and we don't do that with women. Wow. And if women are really easers, <laughs> um, yeah. the men in the church are going to be influenced by the women very much yeah. in direct ways, in personal ways. Yeah. And um, we should be investing in the women yeah. um, in the same way as disciples, because nowhere are we told not to do that in scripture? We're told the opposite. Mm. And, and so many of the verses um, where we're told and even um, exhorted um, and reproved even, uh, you should be teachers by now. And mm. I'm having to tell you this. Um, that's not talking to the men mm, yeah. only. It's yeah. talking to the whole church. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's so many exhortations for teaching for the whole church. Lay people also are active traditioners. We sing God's word to one another and, and teach in that way during worship. We pray for one another. We are passing down the faith. We are promoting one another's holiness. Yeah. Mm. Uh, women, lay women and lay men both need to be invested in. Mm. Um, and so I think there are lots of concrete ways that can be done. Yeah. Um, but we also need to be able to distinguish a worship service and the liturgy going on there mm-hmm. and the authorization in that. Mm. And then 
the rest of church life. Mm, yeah, that's really great. Um, I think uh, it was Jen Wilkin who made the point at the SBC 19. Um, she made it. She made this point that, yeah. um, you know, Paul mentions at the end of his letters several women. He thanks thanks them and tells them to greet them and, and to love them. Um, you know mm-hmm. how and then she asked the question how if in your church how if Paul would come to visit how many women would he thank would he recognize as being in positions where they're mm. growing and flourishing when they're in yeah, positions really. of leadership where they are um you know being mothers yeah. of the church you know where they are being heard where yeah. they are being valued where they are uh out there up front leading mm. um not necessarily at the elder position but they're leading in all these other areas in the church where would if Paul came to your church, would he be able to thank people? Mm. Would would women be at the end of the letter? Yeah, it's a good question mm-hmm. to ask. Um, and so, Amy, I kind of want to end with like, what are some practical things that pastors and lay people can begin doing right now uh, to begin to change the narrative on on complementarianism and to really. Um, empower it's a it's a weird word but empower women to 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 be who god has created them to be mm. as as whole persons yeah, cool. in the church mm-hmm. what are some practical ways they can start doing that right now and i guess if you have any resources uh we'd love to mm-hmm. hear those and then link them in the show notes well i think that pastors can be leading this this conversation and working through these questions because mm. everyone's asking these questions right now yeah um and so maybe like Wednesday night study time would be a really good time to directly address some of this stuff um, and lead the way and um, looking at their own church, seeing mm-hmm. where they uh, do well, mm-hmm. seeing where they would like to improve, um, saying, you know, what their position is in the church, making it clear. Mm-hmm. Um, because some churches will say, well, we believe that the, the position of elder and pastor it, you know, those ordained positions are for qualified men only. Mm. Um, and that otherwise, though, we believe women have lots of leadership roles in the church. But then when you look at the church life, you still don't see that. Yeah. Um, there's still the lay men leading everything. Um, and you don't really hear the woman's voice very much yeah, right. um, on a theological level, on an intellectual level, mm. um, being at the heart of that life in the church. Um, in order to do that, you need to be investing in women. You need to be training women. Yeah. Um, you can't be part of the theological heart of the church if you're not being trained theologically. Yeah. Um, women are looking outside of the church yeah. because they're not being equipped in the church. So they're looking at the parachurch. Mm. Um, who knows what kind of resources? There's good and bad and ugly in those, mm-hmm. right? Um, we see a lot of the ugly coming in. <laughs> um, what, what otherwise would be good churches. Yeah. So that, that is something pastors need to pay attention to. Pastors need to be reading women's writing. Mm. Mm. I think that's huge. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so th- they can be informed in that way. If they believe in the reciprocity, if they believe in a woman's contribution, then they need to be reading it themselves. They need yeah. to be asking questions for the women themselves. One thing my pastor does that I really appreciate is um, he's, he's a very shepherding kind of pastor. And when he's preparing his sermon, a lot of the time, he'll ask somebody in the church, like shoot an email, like, Oh, what do you think about this I'm, that I'm working on here? Because he mm. knows that maybe they've been through something in that area mm. that they could help with, or yeah, they've, sure. um, they've been theologically trained in that area, whatever it is. Mm. And he, he asks just as many women as he asks men, these mm. questions, mm-hmm. I think. Good. Um, at least I know I get, you know, emails <laughs> and I yeah. talk to other women <laughs> who get emails or, you know, he pulls, he's always asking questions. Um, that is a great way to show that you value mm. what somebody has to say. That's right. And, um, That's good. It, and, and you, you hear that in the sermons as well, then, that he is listening to those things, mm. um, that he is wrestling through those very things himself. So I think that's, that's a wonderful way to do it. I think that um, having like exclusive men's and women's ministries are great, and they have a, a good purpose to them, but also having uh, Bible studies that are, are definitely more co-ed. Mm-hmm. So that men and women can um, have that reciprocity and yeah. both contribute in, in that way. Mm. Um, and to be, I, and there's people who disagree with me, but I very much think that women should be um, also leading in some of those, also teaching in some of those. Yeah. And um, co-teaching is even a great idea. Yeah. Um, because this, this is not a role that is 
um, mm. you know, some sort of authority of office, mm. but it's sure. just uh, lay men and lay women teaching each other yeah. Yeah. under the leadership of the church, That's good. which I highly emphasize in all my books. I have a, a really high regard for the church officers yeah. Yeah. and, um, and their, their position that they have their vocation. <laughs> and so, um, I think a lot of times what happens is women get a, a lower regard um, that 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 high position is kind of lowered when you have women's ministries mm. with women serving as functional ministers in those women's ministries. Mm. Um, and that's who the women are looking to. So mm. I do think that women need to be integrated into the church life more. And there's, there's lots of ways Good. to do that. You can Good. have a, a core group of women that you want to invest in mm. um, and maybe bring them to your session meetings every now and then, or your leadership meetings um, for the last half hour and say, how, you know, what am I missing on the pulse of the women in the church? How are my mm. sermons reaching the women in the church? That's Is there good. something that I need really to good. know um, to where I can pastor better? Mm. Um, you know, those kind of things. That's so good. That's really great. Um, Amy, do you have any uh, like any books or um, articles there or podcasts? There are so that... many. You're seeped um, <laughs> <you're seat, you're laughs> in research right now. Um, I don't but... even know. What, what am I doing for my research right now? Well, I mean, Bobby, you're like seeped in the research of this right now. So you're reading everything. Um, but I guess. I am. What, what are... I, and I'm reading from a lot of different sources, yeah. too. Yeah. So um, I like guess. I, I recommended that the concept of woman <laughs> by Sister Prudence Allen, who's, yeah. who's a Roman Catholic. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. I'm actually. Right now, um, just auditing Mark Garcia's course um, at the Greystone, Greystone Institute on theological anthropology because he just has a lot of work that he's done on women created a second, mm -hmm. which I think is is really good. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to read both the super complementarian books like yeah. from CBMW, sure. but also read from egalitarian scholars, uh -oh. scholars mm -hmm. too, so that you can <laughs> see both. Yeah. Um, See what's I just got sent a book, um, Men and Women in Christ, Fresh Light from Biblical Texts by Andrew Bartlett. Mm. Now he he doesn't fall on either side, complementarian or egalitarian, but there's definitely gonna be a lot more um what people would call egalitarian positions in his sure. arguments. Yeah, sure. yeah. Um and you know, I don't align with all of this teaching in the book, but it's extremely sharpening mm. to read. Um, all these different sides and, and egalitarians wouldn't align with everything he's written in his book either. Right. And so I find him uh, refreshingly frustrating, <laughs> which is what I try to be as well, because yes. I think we need that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Man. Yeah. Well, Amy, we have been encouraged and edified by this conversation, and I pray that it's encouraging and edifying to everybody who listens to this mm -hmm. episode. Um, so where where can they read and hear more of your stuff? Okay, so I blog over at the mortification of spin dot org. Um, also, we have a podcast called yep. The Mortification of Spin. And my book coming out in March is really going to be all this stuff put together, hopefully. Um, and I really do hope that, and I'm aiming for church officers to read it. Mm -hmm. It's got discussion questions at the end. There's going to be videos even Great. Um, that, so that they can lead their own churches and, and how they're going to apply all of this and, and what their positions are. And um, so I'm really hoping that it can be a, a really good um, discussion starter. Amen. Absolutely. And you're on Twitter? I'm on Twitter, Amy Bird, HWT, House Life Theologian. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, well, yeah. Amy, thank you so much for coming on. This has been a hugely awesome episode, and I'm excited to see the reaction to it. Mm -hmm. um, push some buttons. Push. We should we should come up with a provocative title for this one. Just Ooh, like a provocative book. title. Ooh. Ooh, I like it. <laughs> we should do it. <laughs> I like it. Trigger warning. Exactly. Yeah. What, what do they call that? It's a uh, uh, misleading headline. Something. Uh, clickbait. Yeah. Clickbait. clickbait. Yeah. Clickbait. Yeah. Yeah. Click, clickbait the heck you out of this call episode. It clickbait. There you go. <laughs> but Amy, thank you so much. Um, you can, guys can get your coffee and cream gear at our store at etsy.com slash shop slash coffee and cream gear. We got t shirts, hats, hoodies, all the like. You can leave an honest five star review on iTunes. Uh, you can head on over to our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram page for mm. updates on what we're doing. I want to give a special shout out to our sponsors, JM Films at jmfilms.com and Switch Coffee at switchcoffee.co. This episode was produced by Nick Francis and was mixed by David Butler. And guys, that is it for this episode of Coffee and Cream. We'll see you guys next time.